Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research's Citizen Series Cafe Politique. This, series, this uh, evening's event is on science and policy, Lake Winnipeg watershed. My name is Robert Erbel, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. MIPR seeks to enhance public policy discourse in Manitoba by nourishing dialogue and debate on current and emerging issues facing Manitobans and their governments. Cafe Politique's events, such as this, are designed to situate and discuss important public policy issues facing our society in an informal manner. Our moderator this evening is Mr. Paul Vogt. Paul is the executive in residence at Manitoba Institute for Policy Research and was the deputy minister to the premier and clerk of executive council until his retirement last summer. I'm going to turn it over to Paul to introduce our guests and to situate tonight's topic. I encourage you to fill out your uh, forms at the end of tonight. Let us know what other topics you'd like and what would be better. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Enjoy the discussion. Uh, I, I'm first going to uh, introduce uh, Minister McIntosh, uh, and then before he speaks, I'll uh, introduce uh, Norm Branson, uh, who will be uh, uh, commenting uh, on the basis of a report that he did uh, several years ago on, on Lake Winnipeg. Uh, but, but I just wanted to say a little bit to, to situate the topic that, uh, that we're discussing today. Uh, I think it's uh, all of you will agree. Uh, one of the most important uh, issues facing our, our, our province, uh, not just because of the the economic importance of the lake, but also its role in our history, um, it, the fact that it's a focal point for for recreation for for so many people uh, from the southern part of the province and for the shoreline uh, communities on Lake Winnipeg, it's also a source of sustenance and, and a very important part of, uh, of the local economy. So the concern uh, that we now have about the health of the lake, uh, which I think is what uh, has really sort of brought this into into focus. Uh, is, is a very important one. I think it's, it's something that uh, will, will deeply affect uh, the whole psyche of the province if, if we can't come to grips with this problem and, uh, and start to move towards solutions. Um, the, uh, the, the thing that interests me about uh, the problem is as somebody who for many years was, was uh, in government and, and working on policy and now more recently uh, 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 teaching at the university, is that um, it's one of those problems uh, political scientists refer to as, as a wicked problem. It's, um, it has a, a complexity to it in the sense that um, uh, we don't yet know uh, all that we need to know to figure out what, what the possible solution would be. Uh, the, the research isn't complete. Uh, and yet there's an urgency, obviously, uh, to start acting before, before all the facts are in. Uh, what we do know indicates that uh, the solution isn't in, in any one uh, group's hands. Uh, not governments, uh, not industry associations or NGOs or, or even uh, broad citizenry. It's, it has to be all of those uh, actors uh, working together, but they have to somehow be drawn together uh, into an effective coalition that then sees this uh, policy issue through uh, as, as really part of a journey, I think, and I think that's what Minister McIntosh is, is going to talk about with the framework that he's launched. Um, now, to introduce uh, Minister McIntosh, our, our first speaker, um, he's been the Minister of Conservation since uh, 2011, so he's the lead minister responsible for not just Lake Winnipeg, but uh, for all of our lakes and rivers, and uh, I guess you could say pretty much our entire natural environment, a uh, small, <laughs> small task. Um, he was prepared for that job by over a decade as, uh, as Attorney General and, uh, and, and Minister of Justice, also serving as, uh, as a government house leader uh, during that time. And some of you may know that uh, many years before that, um, during the, the time of our constitutional debates in, uh, around Beach Lake, uh, uh, Gord was the advisor to, uh, to Elijah Harper. And if you've seen the movie uh, based on that time, uh, you may remember him as well played by the, the character who's sort of wearing these Elton John sized, uh, sized glasses, uh, <laughs> quite, a, quite a memorable uh, appearance that uh, immediately puts you right into that, uh, that, that late 80s uh, time frame. Um, and uh, I, I, can, I can kid uh, Minister McIntosh a bit, uh, he's not only uh, one of the smartest and, and dedicated uh, people I've met in government, but he also is one of the funniest and has, has a tremendous uh, sense of humor. Uh, some people tell me that um, in order to really get the full me measure of the man, you have to go back to Fort Francis with him on one of his many uh, spiritual journeys back to his, uh, his hometown where he's still remembered as being part of a rock group that uh, I think most locals agreed is probably one of the top uh, 100 groups to, to come out of uh, Fort Francis, uh, <laughs> at least in the 1974-75 uh, time period. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce uh, Minister of Conservation, the Honorable Gordon Allen. Uh, thank you. Welcome, my new 
critic, uh, Shannon Martin, here from the legislature of the MLA for Morris. Uh, welcome to the Shannon. And uh, welcome so many lake lovers here. I think you're proving yourselves tonight with the uh, beautiful weather and uh, uh, for the first time in, uh, in, in two years. And, uh, but um, uh, many of you in the audience know much more about this topic than I do, so uh, I'm going to talk about the politics of Lake Winnipeg. I just wanted to say, though, the, uh, the Meech Lake uh, movie, the, uh, the movie Elijah, I really pushed on the producers that they recruit uh, that Paul Gross, right? Um, and they were pushing that cousin, you know, on Red Green? Uh, so it was a compromise. But um, those are uh, life-changing uh, uh, experiences. Uh, and I also, as a former environmental lawyer, had a life-changing experience uh, working for a couple of farmers uh, we're trying to stop the Alameda Dam uh, being built in southern Saskatchewan. Uh, I can tell you another life-changing experience is this particular portfolio. Uh, it has, as many of you in this room um, uh, appreciate, uh, this uh, moral compulsion to it. Uh, when you are standing up for Mother Earth, uh, there is a, an ethical uh, dimension that doesn't come with every kind of advocacy or uh, uh, administrative posting, if you will. Uh, so I commend all of you in the room uh, for that as well, uh, for your, uh, uh, your passion for this uh, challenging um, uh, reality uh, of, uh, of North America. Uh, I just, uh, just in terms of background, uh, I think many of you know, of course, that Lake Winnipeg is the 10th largest lake in the world. Uh, it is uh, what we call the sixth great lake. Um, I was telling... Uh, a group down in International Falls, Alex was there. Uh, I'm being corrected now that it actually, it might not be. Uh, there are some scientists that think that uh, Huron and Michigan are one lake, so they're really messing with my mind because, you know, there's some things I did remember from biology, but it may be the fifth, uh, it may be the fifth grader. Uh, trivia 11% of the water uh, from Canada alone comes through. Uh, this province, and uh, so we rightly can claim to be H2O HQ. Uh, that means that uh, we have a particular niche in terms of demands, I think, for science and research and knowledge and know-how and getting some action done on the challenges that come with being H2O HQ. We all know that uh, in the last uh, year and a half, the lake was declared uh, the world's uh, number one water hotspot. Uh, by an international organization, and that helped to put more international attention, and I think national attention and local attention on this challenge. If it's the most threatened lake, then does everyone know why, and does everyone appreciate what has to be done? So here are some of the challenges that I've come across in, in my brief tenure as conservation minister. We, um, we have, first of all, um, recognized that there are a huge number of sources of the problem. Huge number. And almost all of that huge number is comprised of small contributions. We also know that the watershed is huge. It starts at a place called Bow Lake. It leads to the Bow River in Alberta. <coughs> and it goes to South Dakota goes back to my country uh, by Fort Francis, Minnesota, of course, and everyone knows the Red River Valley. But there's about, what, seven million people uh, in that watershed. There's, what, what nine governments? Um, and two federal governments. And Europeans had this brilliant notion that when they come here, it's really important to establish political boundaries in squares, <laughs> completely oblivious to the lay of the land and to the ecological challenges that should be managed as much as the human populations. So we have this history of square, square places on the map uh, that don't uh, reflect watershed boundaries. So those are the challenges we start with. And then the political ones. In tomorrow now, Manitoba's Green Plan, I hope you've all seen it, it's there online, we'll be introducing some of the changes to it as a result of public feedback and emerging issues in the next uh, few months. The Green Plan set out this concept, and it was one where, where Norm was involved in noodling around in his report he'll talk about, but you've got to bring people together in different ways. And in fact, 
I'll, I'll do a, just a little pitch here for uh, Robert Sanford. There's a book out front called uh, Saving Lake Winnipeg, and he's one of my gurus. This is a really good plain language book about the problem and solutions. But he said there's a mind-boggling level of complexity here. You're talking about your wicked problem. And we've got to work at a higher, more integrated level, again, to quote Robert Sanford. So I took his advice. And we proposed a Lake Winnipeg Accord. And generally got a thumbs up. At least we didn't get anybody giving us a thumbs down except this. It's really good to get out of the legislature. And it's really good to get to places like, let's start with Delrain. And I go and I meet with the conservation district, and please, I hope you all know what they are. If you don't, you gotta, I, I'm, I'm an evangelist for that. People, the further away from Lake Winnipeg, care more about the water at their own feet, on their farm, their own lake and river that they swim in and canoe in. And don't go to Bow Lake and sell a Lake Winnipeg Accord because they ain't interested in that. They're interested in a Lake Friendly Accord, maybe. So we worked with the South Basin Mares and Reefs, and we came back. And you know, that's just that's the, the politics, though. You know, every word is important. You got ten seconds to make your point. Don't talk about Lake Friendly or Lake Winnipeg Accords, Lake Friendly Accords. So that was a shift in thinking about how we talk with people. Next challenge. You can't talk about, um, well, let's put it this way. How do you tell people that swamps are good, swamp thing, creature from the black lagoon, swamps are good things, and nutrients can be bad things? Because my mom wanted me to have nutrients. So there's some political issues there in terms of explaining about wetlands being part of the solution. and excess nutrients being a big part of the problem. It just doesn't, it's not self-evident, I think, to most people, what the connections are. So there are some challenges there. One of the biggest solutions, the low-hanging fruit, are what are called point sources, and that's sewage effluent. The phosphorus, nitrogen that comes from <coughs> sewage discharge. And I don't think that anyone has ever followed any of our ministers around to take pictures about ribbon cuttings and sewage plants. I don't think that when we talk about our, our uh, infrastructure program, people heard anything more than highways and bridges, really. They didn't hear about sewage plants. I keep saying to my colleagues, stop talking about sewage plants and talk about lake-friendly investments, because that's what they are. That's more political, politically salient, and it means something more. Like, for example, the debate that has raged in Winnipeg for, for too long about the north and south end plant upgrades have been characterized as wastewater uh, upgrades. It's about saving Lake Winnipeg and from the biggest single point sources. So it's about how you talk of these solutions and problems that can get you in the door and out the door. Another one, and I'll just end on the language around Lake uh, Winnipeg is it's challenging to uh, get to the get welcomed at a farm gate if you're going to say we have to leave water on the land and we have to slow the flow of water off land because this is one of the big bread baskets of the world and we have to become even more a provider of food to the world there's 200,000 more people in the world today than there were yesterday at 7 p.m. we got a we got a job to do and we've got an agricultural sector that we've got to support, nurture, and grow. But it has to do so sustainably. But don't tell a farmer, you got to stop draining your land. Because next week, they got to get that water off their land. It's how you get it off. And again, instead of talking about leaving water in the land, we have to talk about a phrase we're going to try, sustainable drainage. Drainage that doesn't harm the environment downstream, your neighbor downstream, that is done in a way that can ensure the continued practice of agriculture and its growth in the future for the future of Manitoba. It's a matter of what drainage. And Ducks is here with their science and we'll be releasing very soon a, uh, a drainage licensing overhaul where we're going to put a new risk-based assessment focus on what drainage should happen in Manitoba and we've got to pay attention to those seasonal wetlands that we just can't drain anymore. We can't drain that big stuff. Let alone how we start getting back some of the wetlands that we have lost. But 
The farmers, by the way, are giving us a thumbs up. Cap said good, but on two conditions. Get out of the face of farmers when it comes to just replacing those culverts, 18 inches for 18 inches. Why are you sending your, uh, your officers in to, you know, we can't afford that. We can't afford to have some big licensing red tape for stuff that's just, you know, fixing a ditch. We gotta focus on the changes in the watershed that are making an environmental difference. So that's, that's a foot. So that's some of the politics there. Um, blame, I won't get into blame. Uh, there's enough uh, blame to go around and everyone's in this together. So we've got the Accord. If you're gonna sell the Accord outside of Manitoba, you darn well have to make sure that we're gonna speak uh, with, uh, with uh, some, uh, some credibility, uh, with leadership by example. So the first thing we thought we had to do was put together all of these organizations all of these people, many in this room, that care deeply about the lake and are doing really great things and all have boards and all get money from governments. And many are going off in all directions at once. In fact, there's over 60 of them, believe it or not. So we said, let's get them all in a room. Let's get everybody organized. We'll all have their different mandates, but at least let's understand, number one, what each and everyone's doing. Let's see if where our common ground is. And then let's break into groups. I think we've got six groups now. And we're all focusing on the solutions and what each person can bring to bear, or each organization or effort. And it's reminding everybody that the province has a good role to play, but so does everybody else. So, for example, we have Keystone Agricultural Producers, Curtis McCray, that's chairing the ag section. He's a farmer. And he knows where the potential is, the low-hanging fruit. Then we have an awareness committee led by the South Basin mayors and Reeves, and we've got the uh, you know, community uh, infrastructure people, we've got experts there, we've got the governance group, and, uh, the, and, and that's uh, chaired by the Red River Basin Commission, and Jeff is here, he's uh, the new head, and thank you for coming, Jeff, it's joining us to have the Red River Basin here. And uh, so we're starting to roll in the same direction for the first time now. And it's fighting at sea legs, and it's all very interesting. But I think it's going to happen, and I think there's magic there. For all those of you that have been in that room, I, I think it's starting to gel. We're going to start to define ourselves better and create that website, that constant communications between each other. And we're going to work out those action plans, which will comprise a new Lake Friendly Action Plan that will be the next level of comprehensive uh, effort. Um, so I think uh, those are some of the, um, the challenges, the, the political uh, lens, if you will. Um, uh, maybe just to conclude, in terms of uh, Manitoba leading by example, um, as well, people have said, you know, well, what's, what is Manitoba doing? Um, you know, I, I know you're, you're doing stuff with hog barns or da, 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 da. So we're actually just concluding a document that we're going to get out, and this will be very important to speaking to the other states and provinces, uh, but it, it, it's, uh, it's called Manitoba Lake Friendly in 50 Ways. There are 50 actions under different headings that are underway. Um, big investments, tough laws, strong basin management, local watershed action, leading ed re edge research, world-class awareness. By the way, we have to change this because at the uh, Manitoba Museum, thanks to Dr. Venema here, and the Manitoba Museum, there's this world-class museum exhibit on the cause and, so as an, and solution of eutrophication for Lake Winnipeg. Uh, we're doing world-class stuff here. I don't know if anybody knows this, but we're the only place in the world that has actual eutrophication curriculum materials. Yeah, um, and here's a real zinger. Over the next five years, we have estimated there will be $1 billion of leveraged funding, provincial, federal, and municipal, for Lake Winnipeg. Most of that is comprised of wastewater upgrades, actually 27 wastewater upgrades in the next five years, and many of them in the basin, so, or in the, in, the, uh, in the valley, sorry, all of them in the basin. And that includes 20 million for wastewater upgrades in our provincial parks, because we're talking about leading by example. <laughs> Hoist it on your petard if you don't clean up your, your park wastewater first and foremost where we have complete control. So we're off and running and I'm off to the IJC. I've got a command uh, performance there to uh, um, get a thumbs up, which I think will give us a birth, uh, particularly in uh, speaking with the American states. Uh, our governance committee has got a plan in terms of how to approach each jurisdiction for the accords uh, uh, signing. But I'm very proud to announce that uh, three weeks ago, the Federal Minister of the Environment came to Manitoba, uh, Leona Gukak, and uh, um, along with the South Basin Mayors and Reeves, the first signatures were put on the Lake Friendly Accord. And I'll end with one little uh, footnote. 
the Accord is not only about the jurisdictions of the Basin signing on to do bigger, better, smarter, faster. It's also going to engage sectors, farm sector, the municipal sector, um, individuals, uh, school divisions, municipalities, etc. That's it's like nothing ever seen before. And they will sign on as well, and there'll be a checklist of things that they can do to change their practices to be bigger, better, smarter, faster. So that is going to remind everybody that we're all in this together. Thank you for listening to that. And uh, I think uh, these are exciting times. I think uh, we can do it uh, because we're Manitobans. I think we're organized like we've never been before. And uh, since action really started happening in a comprehensive way since uh, 2005, really, uh, we've stopped the increase of phosphorus concentrations in the lake. We have a long way to go. We have, you know, we, we, we've committed to 50% reduction. That's what Dr. Levitt has said is necessary. Uh, it's not going up anymore. It's not going down in the private, but at least it's going the right direction for the, for the first time. Because until 2005, it was going up and up and up. So we also have to have that measure that we live and die by. Because if you don't have a, you know, you can't cut what you can't count is the old saying that I just made up. Okay, thank you. <laughs>